text I'm pulling is from verse 27 because I want to make a point with it. So I'm jumping in the middle of something. I'm actually jumping in the middle of Psalms 16, 8 through 11. In the middle of Psalm 16, 8, 11, in verse 27 of Acts, he says, Because thou will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow thy Holy One to undergo decay. I want you to pay special attention to something. This is a messianic prophecy of Jesus Christ after he dies on the cross. What's going to Hades? All right, let's remember that. Okay? Okay. That's where my title of my lesson comes from. Nor allow the Holy One to undergo decay. That's his body. His body's in the grave. When his body's in the grave, his soul is where? Hades. Thou hast made known to me the way, ways of life. Thou will make me full of gladness with thy presence. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that both he died and was buried, and his tomb is with us today. And so because he was a prophet, Many people know he's a king, but few knew he was a prophet until they read Psalms. Once they read Psalms, they know he was a prophet. And he was a messianic prophet. He was just a prophet. He wasn't a national prophet. He was a messianic prophet. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to set one of his descendants upon his throne, we call it the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant. He looked ahead. Well, I'm talking about a long way ahead. You're talking about a thousand years. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. That he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, Having been exalted through the resurrection, having been exalted to the right hand of God, number one, number two, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, number two, that's in his exaltation, number three, he has poured forth, Pentecost, he has poured forth this which you both hear and see, see and hear, for it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, set at my right hand until. Now pay attention to the word until. Until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. We have just gone from the first coming to the second coming of Christ. And the resurrection is the key, and the burial is the key to the resurrection. Death, burial, resurrection completes the first advent. What's going to complete the second advent is Operation Footstool. David prophesied all that. A thousand years before Christ ever came into the earth. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, Jesus Christ, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. That's his Pentecost sermon. So I've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. And we're going to talk about this today. I'm going to answer two things. In my sermon today, first I'm going to ask her a question that I'm often asked, where is Hades? I'm going to answer that in point one, and I'm going to tell you, in point two, I'm going to give you seven doctrinal principles of why the burial of the soul of Christ is important to your salvation. 
Not only is it important to your salvation, not only was it a key to the first coming of Christ, it's a key to the second. We're going to learn all that today. So you're going to have to put your thinking cap on, your thinking cap, 2 Peter 3.16. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study the Bible you can't live it nor learn it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. Your responsibility as a believer priest, 1 Peter 2, your responsibility is to confess sin, not to be saved, but to, to regain fellowship through the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That allows you back into fellowship. You never lost your relationship with God. He's still your father and you're still his child. What you have lost is fellowship. What you've lost is fellowship. Your spirituality through, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I give you a moment. I give you a moment to examine yourself in regard to personal sins. Make confessions if necessary. So that the Holy Spirit can minister the truth of this lesson to your soul today in Jesus' name. Our Father, we thank you. These have come our way today to study with us the word of God. And looking at the burial of the soul of Jesus Christ. What is important for us, Father, is that Paul makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That the gospel involves three things. It involves... The death of Christ for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures. In other words, the burial of Christ is an essential part of the message of salvation, while the mechanics is we must believe it, because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, Romans 1.16. And so, Father, encourage our hearts today as we look at the subject matter of the burial of the soul of Christ in a place called Hades, a key doctrine, a key doctrine to the New Covenant Church, a, a doctrine that's often lost and misunderstood and overlooked and neglected, and yet is a key doctrine. So teach it to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. This is an extension from last Sunday's Easter sermon where I dealt with the third day, the doctrine of the third day. Also, a missed opportunity for the churches to identify the importance of the burial of Jesus Christ. And so we talked about that last week out of the text of John 2, 18 through 22. What you've got to be knowledgeable of in the scripture is that when Christ died on the cross, his body went to, the, went to a tomb, the new tomb of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus uh, and Joseph buried him. When he died on that cross, his spirit went back to the Father. I put all this on your paper, Luke 23, 46, for you to examine later. I'm giving you the telling you, and then I'm giving you the textual proof of it. But where did his soul go? The Bible says his soul went to Hades. His soul went to Hades. We learned that in our lesson text today, which was a fulfillment of the prophecy of David in Psalms 16, 8 through 11. Now, when we look at the greater sermon that Peter preached at Pentecost, when we look at it, we start with verse 14 and we go to 36. Now, what's interesting about this sermon is that it actually has three sections based on what we would call the lesson text or the proof scripture. What is the textual proof that Peter was using? So I want to break that down because often it's missed. So I broke Peter's sermon down into three sections, three sections of discussion with Old Testament doctrinal proof texts. In verses 14 through 21, the scripture that the textual, the, the lesson text was Joel 2, 28 through 32. 
Now, I want you to pay my lesson. My lesson's not about that. What my lesson is about is about David's prophecy that he made two times about the Messiah, and they were linked. In the second sections of, of his sermon, Peter's sermon, in Acts, the second chapter, 22 through 28, which you can read later, he used his, the proof text or his lesson text for that information came from Psalm 16, 8 through 11, which I read. The third section that he discussed in Acts, the second chapter, 29 through 36, is based on Psalms 110, verse 1 a messianic prophecy about Operation Footstool. Now, here's what's important. Psalm 16, 8 through 11, deals with the first coming of Christ. Psalms 110, verse 1, deals with the second coming of Christ. The link between the first coming and the second coming is his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. That's the link. What he did here is amazing. In Psalm 16, he put the first coming of Christ. In Psalms 110, he put the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ is dealing with Operation Footstool. That's what we call eschatology, or the new covenant teaching of the second coming of Christ. So, what I did, because I want to pick those two pro prophecies of David up, I took my text, our lesson text, goes second chapter, 27 through 36. Okay? Okay? And what we are told by David and then by Peter, David prophesied it. Peter said it happened. Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. That's, that's Matthew 5, 17. Jesus said it came in the world to fulfill prophecy, messianic prophecy. And what it tells us that when Christ died on the cross, while his body was put in a new tomb of Joseph, his soul Went to Hades. Is that the prophecy of Psalms 16? I didn't make this up. Come on. I didn't, I didn't make up the idea that his soul went to Hades. It was prophetic, was it not? And Peter said it was fulfilled. All right. In Acts 2.27, we read, and this is important, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, which is quoted from Psalms 1610. Now, I want you to circle the word abandon because Jesus was concerned about that. The, the whole thing of Gethsemane prayer where he's sweating blood and all that business is about this. It does not want to be abandoned in Sheol. When the debt's paid on the cross where he cries out, Psalms 22, 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He wants to go to Sheol. He, doesn't, he wants to be back out of Sheol. I mean, that was his concern. And here's the prophetic word to him. This is, his, this is the prophetic word to Christ. Because you will, you will not abandon my. See, that's a prophetic word to Jesus, isn't it? I'm not going there. It's not a prophetic word to me. When I die, I'm not going to Sheol. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to where Christ is. And the only reason I am is because he conquered the death and the grave. And he set a new order. When we die, we go to heaven. That wasn't true in the old, old covenant. It's true in the new covenant. This is a promise that Jesus is holding to, to go to the cross and go to the burial. The resurrection is a key for him. 
I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. For Jesus, the resurrection is everything. Because you, my father, this is it. Because you, my father, will not abandon. Because you prophesied. You prophesied. Or for Jesus, you promised me. Would you not believe that? I mean, that's what we hold on to. This is how we live our daily life. We hold on. And we speak to the Father this way. This is what prayer is about. This is how we speak to God. But God, you have promised me. I know you will not abandon me, but you've promised me. That's what gets us through the day. I mean, when it gets piled up on you, that's, that's, that's when this thing becomes dynamite. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo Decay, that's his body. He's talking about his body and his soul, and it's a prayer. It's a prayer just like you and I pray. We pray off the word of God. You know, that's at 1 John 5, 14 and 50. You want your prayers answered? Pray according to his will. You put the promise back to the Father and say, this is what I'm trusting, Father. Let me tell you what I'm praying. I'm praying this based on this, Father. And I'm confident that your character, that has always been true, will be true in this way in my life. You pr Do you know that's your prayer life? If you have one, that's it. that's it. If you don't have one, you don't know what I'm talking about. And you should know what I'm talking about. And listen to this. Martha. See, this three-day business was important. We talked about it last week. Listen to what Martha. He sa she says to him, at the death of Lazarus, you know, why didn't you come? You could we, could, we could, we didn't have to go through this funeral. And this is what he says to him. He said, well, I'm here now. Yeah. But. Lord, by this time, there will be a stench, body rot, for he has been dead four days. That's why three days is important and no decay is a big issue. Do you understand what he prayed? Now, I'm going to talk about two things, but they're long. First of all, where in the world is Haiti? So my point number one, in the last two sections of our lesson today, de dealing with Psalm 16 and Psalms 110, Peter's sermon at Pentecost, in this sermon he connected the first coming in Psalm 16 with the second coming in Psalms 110. And it involves the burial and resurrection. They're the key. There, there's no burial. There's no resurrection. Peter did it by quoting a messianic prophecy of David. He, David, looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. In other words, he linked theologically the first coming to the second coming with his burial and resurrection. Don't leave my soul in Hades. Three days and I'll be out of the grave. Now, the, now, God kept him busy for three days. It wasn't vacation. He, he was on a mission. And so he says, watch the word. And he spoke ahead of the resurrection. Watch the word neither and nor. that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Okay? Now, let me tell you where Hades is. In Isaiah, the 14th chapter, verse 9, it says it's beneath the earth. That's beneath your feet. Right? Even in, if you're on an elevator. <laughs> I 
It's beneath the earth where your feet, where you live. In Philippians, the second chapter, verse 10, it says it's under the earth. And in Ephesians 4, 9, it says it's in a lower part of the earth, which we would call the heart. Hades was located in the middle or in the heart of the earth. I'm talking about planet earth. Since we're involved in space travel, that's where it is. Now, you can read all that yourself because I'm after the doctrine of it. Point number two. And here's where we get into the doctrine of it. The burial of the soul of Jesus Christ in Hades is an important new covenant doctrine. It's important to the first coming of Christ, and it's important to the second coming of Christ. In this point, point number two, we will study seven doctrinal principles regarding the doctrine of the burial of the soul of Jesus and how important it is to the first coming and the second coming. It's important to the first coming because it's part of the gospel of salvation. It's, impart, it's important to the second coming because when he comes back, he doesn't come back as a savior, he comes back as a judge. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 28, he came the first time for sin. The second time he comes as judge. Here comes the judge. I'll take you back a ways. So let me give you seven points. Let me give you seven points. And this is well worth your read. Now, I only got 30 minutes. This is a two-hour study. So you're going to have to go home and read some. But I'm going to give you some highlights in it. Number one, I, must, I wanted to start with the one that everybody knows about. Jesus kept an appointment with one of the thieves while on the cross. Remember that? He hung with... With, with two other thieves. I mean, he was classified one himself. But he hung there with two thieves. And one of them, he made a promise. In Luke, the 23rd chapter, verse 44, let me tell you what he started with. And listen, we got to believe it was pretty hard to talk from the cross after six hours on it. He took a terrible beating, carried the cross, got nailed to it, and hung there without the, with very little ability to breathe. And when he spoke, it put him closer to death than before he spoke. In human terms. Most of the time, you suffocated. And he spoke six times from the cross. One of them was to this thief. There are a lot of things you might say on deathbed, quotes on the deathbed, but looking out for somebody else's welfare, welfare? <laughs> I don't know. Listen to what he said, though. with breath air as important as anything in life at this point in him, he started a conversation with this guy by saying, truly, I say unto you. Now, if you're just a new person coming into this church, you don't understand how the dynamics. When Jesus ever said anything, truly, truly, I say unto you, at was. You could write it down, take it to the bank. Right? We've done this study. You always pay attention to whatever, whatever Jesus says, truly, truly, I say unto you, you want to write it down, boy. That's a check you can cash. He begins this conversation when little breath is life in itself. He begins a conversation with this guy. Truly, I say to you, this is a criminal who is facing the death penalty, is going to die in a short time, and Jesus says to him, I give you a check. 
that you can cash today. <laughs> you think it didn't change that old thief's whole, whole life in a split second? Because let me tell you, that check that Jesus gave him kept him from going to the place of torment in Hades and sent him to paradise instead of torment. And when he says, truly, truly, I say to you, he's passed him a check that is good to cash. And how is he going to cash it? Because he's going to die in a moment. Listen to me. He's going to cash it the way, say, same way you can. Because let me tell you, without faith in the gospel of Christ, I'm not talking church. I'm talking faith in the gospel of Christ that he hung on the cross for your sin and mine. That he was buried and a third day raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. You can die and go to torment or you can take this check and cash it by faith. You will not go to the place of torment. If you die without Christ, you go to the place of torment, which the old church called hell. You'll know it's real when you get there, buddy. You'll get there when you... Listen, you need to go home and read Luke 16. When he said, truly, truly, I say to you, he passed him a check. that said, you will not go to torment. This is a check that says you will not go to torment. You will go to paradise. He said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, today, not tomorrow, today, you will be with me in paradise. That guy could not do anything to be saved except believe that Christ hung on that cross for his sins, would go to the grave, and would be, and in the grave, he would meet him in paradise. Are you with me? Do you understand that? See, the average guy is going to read, but truly I say to you, like we're having tea. We all went out and had a cup of coffee and a donut. Life is good. They hung it on a cross, paying for the death penalty. When he passed him this check, he'd have gave them both the check if they'd have been willing. He'd have given them both the check, but only one believed who he was. He said, I deserve to hang on a cross, but you deserve not to hang on a cross. Jesus said, listen, I'm here for you. Here's a check. Cash it. You cash it by faith. That's one reason his soul went to Hades. Went to a place called paradise. Also called Abraham's bosom. In Luke, the 16th chapter is called Abraham's bosom. Luke 16. And there, when you read that in verse 22, you're going to find a poor beggar who believed in Jesus Christ, died, went to Abraham's bosom. A Jewish, a Jewish poor beggar. Not a beggar anymore. No siree. When he died, he cast his check because before he died, he believed. That Jesus has died for his sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. Cast his check before he left this life. Cast his check that says, I'm going, to, I'm going to Abraham's bosom. I'm not going to torment. And whose check? Who, who was the guy? Whose check did he cash? The check that Jesus gave him. A free pass. It's called grace. It's a gift. Salvation is a gift. Here's the second reason he went to, went to uh, Hades, why his soul went to Hades. Jesus met, listen to me, 
Jesus met with his deceased followers of his earthly ministry who had died. Oh, yeah. You can read this in Matthew, the 27th chapter, verses 50 through 54. In verse 55, we find Christ on the cross from the sixth hour to the ninth, which is in our language, noon to 3 p.m., where he hung on the cross suffering for the sins of the world. In verse 46, it says at the ninth hour or 3 p.m., Christ cried out to God and yielded up his spirit. In verse 51, the moment he died on the cross and cried out, Father, receive my spirit. The veil of the temple, the veil of the Jewish temple that separated the holy place from the holies of holies where atonement took place for the sacrifice for sin, ref reflective of Christ on the cross, was torn down from the top to the bottom. It rendered the temple useless. It fulfilled its purpose. When Christ died on the cross, it fulfilled the purpose of the whole Jewish system, sacrificial system. At the same time, an earthquake hit. It knocked rocks. It, it blew rocks out. And at that time, certain, certain tombs in the graveyard Certain tombs were blown open. When you went around to see whose tombs they were, they all had a commonality. They were all followers of Christ. Nobody came out of the grave in verse 51 until after the resurrection, after the resurrection of Jesus on Sunday, these people went into the city of Jerusalem and witnessed them being alive. Did you know that was in the Bible? Where were these people and Jesus three days before his resurrection? They were in a place called Abraham's bosom, and he was having a conference with him. Hooah! Did you know that? He's having a Bible conference. He's prepping them to go on a mission trip. Talk about the first mission trip in the New Covenant. You got it. You want to get really crazy? Some of the people listening to Peter's Pentecostal sermon is these people. Say, I think this way. I'm writing, always writing books that never get done. Listen to that. Listen, did you know all that? Did you know all that? Wow. How about the third thing? Jesus gave an official message to the fallen angels of Genesis 6. He went to a place called Tatarsis, Tataras. And there he spoke to the fallen angels of Genesis 6 and spoke about the second coming of Christ to them because they're going to be involved. Did you know that they're going to come out of the grave at mid-trib and the middle of the tribulation and begin a warfare of all warfares against Christ? In the middle of the tribulation. Revelation 9. He has a conference with them. He has a conference with them because he's going to tell them, listen, the first coming, I've already whipped it, and the second coming, you're going to be in deep trouble because when I get through with you the second time, you're not going to a place like this. This is vacation. I'm going to send you to the lake of fire. This is vacation. Tarsus, listen, for angels, for angels who operated in light, the Bible says they were put in total darkness. That's bondage. 
You knew all this, didn't you? You want to read more about it? You should go to 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. Oh, that's a wonderful passage on this very subject. And he made a public proclamation to him. I got you in the first coming. I'm going to do you in the second coming. Matthew 25, 41. Did you know that's in the Bible? How come you don't know that's in the Bible? I haven't left the importance of what Christ came into the world to do. I've, I've stayed in that periphery. How is it possible that the actual death of Christ on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection, you don't know this. That's the most important thing that you could know. These are basic doctrines about salvation. What I'm trying to encourage you to do, well, what I'm actually trying to get you to do is study the Bible. Would you please study the Bible? That's all I'm doing. I, I get a little passionate about all this stuff. I get passionate about this. This is so important to your life. Just start reading the Bible a little bit. Get a cross-reference Bible so you can keep up with all the Second Peter, the second chapter, 4 and 5. They're put in eternal bonds under total darkness. Jude, the sixth chapter, Luke 8, 31. Tartarus is called the abyss. It's called the bottomless pit. All of these references are to that. In other words, by now you understand that in Hades, called Sheol in the Hebrew, there were three parts. There's Abraham's bosom where believers went. There's a place torment where unbelievers went. And there's a place called Tartarus where the fallen angels go. And I've given you ample information. If you've got a study Bible, you could just spend your life studying this. Number four. Oh, this is so important. hoo -ah. This one's a hoo -ah. Or in the old church, we say amen. Jesus officially shut down paradise. Abraham's bosom of Hades during the church age. Everybody who died prior to his resurrection, that's where they went. Not so after his resurrection. Hoo-ah. Not after his resurrection. 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, 6 through 8, says when a believer dies, boom, he goes to heaven to be with Jesus. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, 1 through 4, says that we're talking about the third heaven. When Paul died, that's where he went and came back. He shut it down. He shut paradise down. You don't die and go down. You die and go up. That ought to bring you great comfort. I mean, you're at a place looking down on the earth, not in the earth looking up wondering where you are. I mean, even Jesus didn't want to be abandoned there. Now, Abraham's bosom is called paradise, and so that's a pretty good state, I suppose. Nowhere near as good as dying and going to heaven. That's hitting the lottery, Bubba. That's a big-time deal. Number five, Jesus was given the keys to Hades for the second coming judgment. He come out of the grave, he had a set of keys on. I love that commercial where that, that black uh, officer comes in, he's had a tough day, and he just throws his keys over there, and he, I, went, I wish I could do that. that. I'd live for that moment. Throws it over there, and it hooks up. I go like, television. Television. I love that. That's him. He walks out of there. He's got, a, he's got, he's got keys. I got keys that jingle, jangle, jingle. <laughs> keys. Keys to Hades. Revelation 118. I am the first and the last. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the living one. I was dead and I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. 
jingles. Did you know that? <laughs> Did you know that? Did you know our Savior has the keys to Hades and death? Oh, you ought to get happy. If you're saved, you ought to get happy. If you're not saved, just a pretty sad sermon for you. Here's number six. Jesus' temporary, temporary presence in Hades, three days and three nights. That's a vacation, huh? Free. <laughs> How about that, Dale? Matthew 12, 38 through 40, which we pointed out, pointed towards the resurrection. The burial points to a resurrection and an ascension and session. Do you realize Jesus came out of the grave? He ascends back to the Father. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father. You know what he's waiting on? Second coming. As soon as the Father says, it's time. Da 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 da. I just felt like singing and dancing today, don't I? Watch out. Listen, all the, the burial leads to the resurrection, the resurrection to the exaltation of Christ. Up from the grave he arose, where'd he go? He went to the right hand of God and the Father in heaven. Where do you go? If you die, you go there. That's where you go. But you got to have free pass. Don't pull no card. Don't go up with a card that says, well, I lived a pretty good old life. I went to church. My grandfather, everybody's got somebody in their family who preaches in this island. If you have it, your family really got left off the, the, the train track, didn't they? I mean, somewhere. I mean, everybody, I mean, well, my grandfather, my aunt, uncle, or my twin brothers, they have twin churches, and I don't know. Acts 2.33. Exalted to the right hand. Watch this. I love this. Listen to this, church people. When he was exalted to the right hand of God the Father, he received the promise from the Father of the Holy Spirit. At Pentecost, they said, which is being poured out, Matthew 3.11. Acts 5.31. God exalted him to his right hand. Listen to me. You know how God, listen, when, God, when he, Jesus seated at the right hand of God the Father, God calls him the prince and the savior. Oh, yeah. You, well, you need to read Acts 531. God exalted him to the right hand as a prince and a savior. That's how he sets in heaven. In Philippians 2, 9 and 10, God highly exalted him and give him a name above every name. Oh, yeah? Well, in verse 10, it says, that name of Jesus, that name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in heaven. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in heaven and on earth. Every tongue, they're under, under the earth. <laughs> you know where under the earth is? Da, 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 da. Point seven. I'm going to get through with this. I won't be on time, but I'm going to get through with this. You didn't think I could get through with it, did you, Billy? No, Billy didn't. No, Billy, no. Yeah, there's no way. Point number seven. Now, of course, you got to go home and read because, you know, it would have been wonderful if I could have opened the scriptures to you and read. Listen, when you open it, you let the Holy Spirit show you stuff. Don't just read it and go like, well, I read. Uh-uh. No, read to learn it, to live it. Listen, verse 7, point 7. In session, Jesus was given all authority in heaven and on earth. Don't you worry. Don't you worry about climate change. He controls the thermostat. Do not worry about it. Do not worry you're going to run out of food on earth. In 12 days, 12 years or something, we're all going to die. I've heard that so many times, I'm sick of it. Where is God? He's on it. Listen, he's, he, he's sitting right next to his son. His son's got all authority. Nothing goes on that he don't sign off on. Nothing. Not in your life, not, not in your life, whether you're on planet Earth or some other planet. I don't know. 
on where you are on another planet. I think sometimes people think I'm on another planet. In session, he sets. In session, he sets. You go, well, what's the big deal about that? He's setting, waiting on the Father to go, second coming, son. It's time for the second coming. He sets and waits for the God to nod. He's not waiting to do things. He's, he's, he's got authority on heaven and earth. He's got pretty, not only that, but he's the head of the church. I mean, it's not, not like he's, on, he's loafing. <laughs> you understand? He's not sitting loafing. Oh, what am I going to do today? Well, this is what a boring job I have. Yeah. He's sitting, awaiting the Father to nod and say, second coming. And then he gets excited. Da, da, da. <laughs> Wrapping this up, are we, Father, are we wrapping this up to go to a whole new system? We're about to wrap it all up, son. Let's get it. Let's wrap it up good because we're looking at a new heaven and a new earth. All these people going up and they're, they're hunting this in the sky and hunting that in the sky. Listen, it's all been laid out. What they're looking for, they'll never find until we get there. It's called the new heaven and new earth. By then, whoever's looking for it won't be there, so it won't matter. But we'll know because we'll be there. What they're looking for, we'll know. What they're looking for, I already know exists. They're going to planet hop. They'll go to Mars, then go here and go there. And then, what are you looking for? What they're looking for is the new heaven and the new earth. Ta -da! I already know it, and I'm dumber than a brick. Oh, I ain't got all those fancy degrees, and yet I know that. How did I know that? Because I listened to the genius of God teach me. The genius of God. The foolish people go out there and look for all that stuff. Looking for a new heaven and a new earth. I got it. They won't listen to me. They won't listen to me. Who's going to listen to this cracker? They don't listen to me. They don't listen to me. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, well worth your read. God put all things in subjections under his feet. God put in subjection everything under his feet. I can't tell you how important that is. And he's the head over the church. Listen to Psalms 110, 1, quoted by Peter in Acts 2, 34, 35, that he will set until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's going to fulfill Genesis 3.15. It's going to fulfill Romans 16.20. It is called Operation, it's called Operation Footstool, which basically means, I'm going to come back one day and I'm going to study this with you. But basically what this means, that Satan, Operation Footstool, Satan and all the fallen angels were removed from the earth, and we'd be bound to Tartarus, the angelic prison, for 1,000 years of the millennial reign of earth. Then he's going to come and wrap this whole deal up at Gog and Magog. And this group is going to be cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20. Ooh, did you know all that? Did you know that all of this is attached to the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every bit of this. Aren't you glad you came today? You could go to church in 50 years and not hear that. That's why God brought you here. You need to know this stuff. You need to know it. And I need to teach it. And we make a good team. <laughs> we make a good team. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this study today. Who would have ever believed all of this attached to the burial of Christ? Oh, I know who believed it, Jesus. Yes, and he talked a great deal about it. We're so thankful for it. Oh, if there's somebody in the sound of my voice today on the Internet or is sitting here and doesn't take seriously 
that Jesus Christ died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead so he could write them a check, a free, a freebie in order to get out of where they're headed, torment, to go to a place called paradise, or better than that, into the presence of Jesus Christ himself when they die. They must believe that Jesus died for their sins, was buried, raised from the dead. And when they believe it, the power to save them is in the gospel. And when they believe it, they're saved. And when they're saved, they have a free pass to heaven. Compliments of the grace of God. Compliments of the work of Christ. None of themselves. They could have never earned it, never bought it. It was given as a gift. It was gift, a gift given to the thief on the cross. Boy, God, you just take anybody. Only through his son, but only through the son. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to, but no man comes to the Father except through me. Thank you, Father. And when they do, they get these, this gift. They get the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> oh, Father. What a wonderful plan. What a privilege it is to preach it. Bless this offering, Father, as we take it today for those who are our people who understand the principle of grace giving. May we be good stewards, Father, to take and multiply it as far as to the ends of the earth to reach the most with the least. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.